So uh, Elizabeth Rowry is not here yet. But I'm going to invite um, Tim and Sue to actually talk to us a bit about what's going on in the legislature this session and where we are. Um, so uh, let's see, Tim was on first. We're gonna let Tim go first and talk about the Senate and then we're gonna let Sue talk about the House and they flipped things already this session. So Tim. Okay. Thank you, Linda. Thank you uh, so much. Um, glad to join you here. I wish it was in person, of course, but uh, this will this will work. And I, I have a, a good feel that maybe uh, you know next session we'll be able to do this in person. I, let's keep keep our fingers crossed about all that, okay? And keep doing the right thing, everybody. So uh, anyhow, thank you for the opportunity to sort of speak. I, I'm gonna speak in broad terms about where, well, not only the Senate is, but maybe where I think this session is at this point in time, some of the key uh, issues that we're dealing with. Uh, as far as where we're at, well, we are, let's see, I think we're gonna be coming up on the third week of the second half of the session. So, you know, uh, several weeks ago, the Senate uh, ended up, uh, its Senate bills in, in, as a house of originality and the uh, house did the same thing the bills that passed in each of those chambers, of course, then cross over to the other chamber for further consideration. And they have to be, as we all know, have to be uh, approved by both chambers and then uh, signed by the governor before they, be, they become law. But at least we have a pretty good feel now of what the major issues are, you might say. And uh, I'm gonna just touch on several of those, maybe a couple of specific bills then that I'm working on, but. The big issues, of course, it's a budget year, so the budget's always a huge issue. And I think at the top of that uh, list will be education. And how much are we funding education? And I still believe we should find a way to give teachers a pay increase. You know, the governor commissioned this study, uh, which did occur and showed us that we are lagging in the state of Indiana when it comes to the pay for our teachers. And we should do something about that. So we'll see, the budget is a, always a work in process. This year, it's particularly a work in process. We always wait to see what the final uh, predict, predictions are in terms of revenues. Also, we have, to, I think, to hopefully maybe we'll have a little more information as to the federal the dollars that are coming in with this most recent package that was passed in Washington, DC and how that could impact the coming two year budget. So it's a big deal. We'll have to continue. There's so many other issues and, and, and priorities that we have to look at in terms of funding, but uh, we'll continue to work on that. The uh, House Senate, uh, the, the way the budget works, it's a House bill, 1001, first uh, bill that they have. Uh, they send us their version of the budget, and then the Senate starts working on it. I believe the coming weekend. Senate appropriations, they'll really take a harder look at what's in that budget and uh, perhaps have further ideas on how it should be, uh, should be modified. Uh, okay, other issues I think are big. Um, well, the pandemic and uh, a major issue which is percolating at the State House has to do with how the governor's powers played out in this emergency and how they are continuing to play out. It's an interesting dynamic because of course, uh, political wise, both the governor and uh, the super majorities in the General Assembly are Republican. And it seems that it's the Republicans that are taking more exception with the powers of the governor than really the Democrats at this point in time. I found myself in the unusual position of having to defend the governor and some of the things that he's done. Uh, not that I've totally agreed with the governor, I've, I've had issues with him too. But we have these bills out there which are being considered, which would really, I, I think, pretty drastically alter what his emergency powers could be going forward and how long he would have those powers without having to ask the General Assembly for permission to continue with those powers. We're getting into state constitution uh, issues as to whether or not we, how much we can do to rein in the, the governor. And so, we heard the uh, in rules, the rules committee on Thursday, the last thing we did before we broke for the weekend was 
consider the House bill in that regards. There was a Senate bill that was passed, and then I think there's going to be an attempt to maybe uh, you know, reconcile those and come up with something. But it's going to be an interesting situation. I, I, I think it is important that the General Assemblies be advised as to what's going on, consulted to a degree. But I, I'm not in favor of us in any way trying to preempt the governor in terms of how to deal with an emergency uh, situation, true emergency situations like we've had with this pandemic. So that's an interesting issue that's out there. And then a final issue that I will talk about, uh, and there's many, many more we could, home rule. Home rule, I think, is under attack down to, at the state house. You see it in the various bills that are trying to limit uh, home rule in Marion County, but also in all counties. And, and we know that there's a bill right now, House Bill 1381, which came over, which would restrict local, local control over solar wind energy uh, type of projects. Um, you know, I see both sides of that, but there are other uh, bills out there too, which have attacked the rights of uh, locals to control uh, issues which are important to the people in, in the community. So those are important uh, issues. I'll mention two bills that I have. One is Senate Bill two, uh, uh, 236 on land banks. And it's an exciting bill. Muncie has a land bank. And, and so we're working to try to give them some more tools to help them to turn around blighted properties, put properties back on the tax rolls. And I wanna thank uh, Sue Arrington, who is uh, my sponsor of that bill over in the House. The bill passed out of the Senate 47 to one. Uh, it's going to be heard on Wednesday uh, in the, the House uh, local government uh, body. I'll let Sue maybe talk a little more about that if she wants to, but it would provide the land banks an important tool to have access to properties which have been put up for sale twice on the uh, uh, tax, uh, delinquent tax auctions and not sold. And it would uh, allow the land banks to look at those properties and acquire those properties if they deem it to be appropriate and then do what they are supposed to do and try to turn those properties around and put them back as productive uh, tax generating properties. I uh, also want to mention uh, Senate Bill 276, which is a bill that I was asked to uh, sponsor for on adult guardianships. And uh, unfortunately, it's sort of a product of the pandemic too. Uh, it's sort of a sad situation when there's nobody to serve as a guardian for an adult and the courts have to appoint somebody. And, and fortunately, we do have uh, a program that does that. But you know, one of the saddest things that they've had to do is to uh, bury somebody award who, whether it was COVID or otherwise, they find themselves in the position as guardian looking at that situation. And quite frankly, it's not clear right now they even have the legal power to do that. So this bill would vest a guardian with the power to make the final arrangements for the award. So those, those uh, that's a lot I went through there, but I think I tried to hit the broad uh, major issues and uh, I guess I'll, I'll turn over to Sue then if she's ready. Now, thank you, Tim. Uh, I think you did hit the, um, you know, the biggest bills that are going through the, the General Assembly this year. And I guess, in, you know, I am on the same page with you on the governor and his powers. Uh, I voted against the House bill that is now over in the Senate. Um, I think, there are a lot of ways legislative leaders can have input, especially when they're in the same party <laughs> as the governor, without having to, um, uh, you know, limit his ability to to deal with a a crisis. Um, so I don't know why. I mean, he, they could have asked the governor to call a special session, but from what I understand, that request was never made. So um, we'll see what happens with this bill. Um, as far as the budget is concerned, uh, I voted against it because of uh, how it deals with school funding for 
Um, you know, our traditional K-12 schools, very modest increase. In fact, not enough to keep up with inflation in some cases, while at the same time making huge increases in our uh, school voucher program and introducing another really, uh, I don't know, another concept that I think is very, uh, we should be very careful about. And that is, it would be sort of like establishing the health uh, savings accounts, only this would be for education. Uh, parents who opt for this would be given something like a debit card or uh, an app and could buy uh, what they want for their children uh, so that they could probably mostly be homeschooled. Uh, but there's really no guardrails on what those, um, those debit cards can be used for. The, the accountability uh, for that is not spelled out in the bill. And so I think it's a very dangerous place to be headed. So I hope the Senate will um, eliminate that one and, and rein in the, the voucher part because it really does, the voucher part really does expand uh, the income level that uh, families can have. I think it's a family of four can have up to $150,000. And if you remember this program, when it first started several years ago was for low income children trapped in low performing schools. And it's evolved into something very different from that. So here we see ourselves ready to spend large amounts of money on the, the children who are in you know, private schools, charters, which are maybe at most 5% of our students. So I think we need to rebalance our budget priorities for schools. And as Tim says, we need to get some money in there for teacher pay. A um, couple other areas that I'd like to talk about, and they may be in some of your questions too, deal with um, two of the committees I'm on. I am the ranking minority member of the Environmental Affairs Committee, which uh, as you saw in the news has not met yet. <laughs> Even though there have been some, you know, really good bills that just, you know, in, that were introduced in the House committee and died there for lack of, of a hearing. Um, however, we are going to meet as a committee uh, next on Monday. Um, this is the committee that the wetlands bill is in. Mm. And we don't have that on the schedule yet. So um, if some of you want to know more about what's happening with that, just raise the question. Uh, the other um, committee I'm in is a very active one, and that's elections committee. This is my first year to be on the elections committee. And I know this is a committee that the league watches very closely. <laughs> so um, we've, as a house committee and they got through the house, there were two bills uh, that have passed over to the Senate. Uh, 1357 deals with straight ticket voting and 1479 would allow counties to add satellite offices for the third Saturday of early voting. So instead of two Saturdays, well, two weeks available with two Saturdays, there, if the county wants to do it, they can have a satellite office with a third Saturday. And I think the, the big, uh, well, then we also, uh, there's one coming over in the Senate that we are discussing now in committee one of the things it would do would be to allow uh, young people uh, who are not yet old enough to vote to be uh, workers in elections, which I think is a really good um, training opportunity and getting kids interested in elections and, and maybe helping to set their habits for voting after they're old enough. Um, 
so that's uh, SV260 and um, but SV353 uh, is one that I am concerned that it could um, suppress voting with some of the uh, the, the um, provisions in it. So um, there are some, there are other bills in both committees, uh, well, in all of the committees that we have until April 7th, which is the last committee day in the House to deal with uh, bills that come over from the Senate. So there is time to see uh, more things happening. And uh, I'm really excited about the land bank bill that's going to be heard Wednesday and hope we can get that one through. Linda, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, thank you both. <laughs> if you have questions, please put them uh, in the chat in case we're in a discussion and so we don't forget any of them. Um, and I, but I would like to jump back first to House Bill 1005 and the uh, education scholarship accounts because as I read that, the grants are gonna be given out through this online portal written, uh, run by the Indiana treasurer. And so parents would get their funds on a debit card. There are no, uh, there's no check on the parents required. They, no background check, nothing to say um, whether, you know, I mean, no, you know, they, that's required of teachers. And this is going to parents. No record of neglect or abuse or fraud um, that has to be identified. The reason I raise this is that the eligible students for the parents getting this um, ESA are special ed, active military, and foster students. Those are the eligible students for whom parents can get this ESA. There is no supervision, no accountability, no community responsibility. Um, the bill says the parent must agree that they will use part of the money for the student's study in the subject of reading, grammar, mathematics, social studies, or science, or the student's individualized education program. But there's, they specifically ban curriculum oversight by the state. So we're giving tax dollars to people who may not have the student's best interests in, in mind. Not that some won't and that this might work, but this concerns me a great deal. And I think this is um, a significant problem uh, with this particular bill. So Sue and Tim were being nice about it. I'm <laughs> really concerned about this bill. Um, so, you know, our constitution in, in Indiana says that the state must provide a public education for its residents. This bill does not, does not help get us to that point. It's diverting tax dollars for families that choose private over public education. And, uh, I, I mean, this is, this is even worse than the vouchers, I think. And expanding think so that, <laughs> yeah. And in states where so, they have it, they've found some of the, um, you know, your concerns are valid about how some of these parents are, or custodians are spending the money. Right. I mean, somebody could order, say they want uniforms for their children, order them on Amazon, get them, send them back and buy something else. There's nothing that would keep them from doing that. Yeah. Um, anything you wanna add on that, Tim? I think you guys need to do everything you can and we all need to pressure uh, every legislator we can get to, to defeat this bill, but. Right. 
it's it's a, it, what's happening with uh, the diversion of, of funding from public education to me is deplorable, especially since we know we're not we're not staying up with where we should be as a state for funding for public education. And here we are just enacting uh, multiple ways to continue to, to di divert funding from the public schools, whether it's uh, what I would you know, term a voucher explosion, which is what I think is going to happen if we pass this budget the way it is. And, and then with 1005, just handing more ways to uh, allow people to uh, uh, you know, bypass and get a public uh, uh, support for private educations, which as you say, Linda, that's not what I believe the Indiana Constitution requires us to do. It's to support public education in my, my mind. So I'll be working as hard as, and I know our caucus will to try to defeat uh, both of those ideas. Um, but you're right, people need to get engaged and uh, they need to call all of the legislators and let them know about their concerns and, and uh, because those are both, I think, harmful to public education. And we know that you two are working very hard on these issues, but you're in a super minority. Right. And we know that the super majority can enact anything they want without even talking to you. Yeah. That's Which is why wonderful. we all have to be out there working on fair maps and right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, we had a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Sue, can you talk more about the details in the bill uh, that could potentially suppress voting? I think that was SB 353. Yes, uh, that one has come over from the Senate. We haven't heard about it yet. Uh, it has been discussed over on the floor of the Senate. So uh, yeah. I, I may I have more to say about yeah. it. I could share at least one, it was several weeks ago now, so I don't remember all the details, but I do remember one aspect of it, which I thought made no sense to me and which I think could really result in, in people being disenfranchised. And of course it's aimed at absentee uh, voting. And so there was a provision, there was a provision in the bill which says that if uh, the voter ID number on the application for the absentee does not match the voter ID number on the registration application or the registration, the voter registration of the voter, that that will disqualify that application. Well, here's the problem with that. There are two ways, it's my understanding, that you can have you could put your voter identification. One would be the last four digits of your social security number, or if you're hesitant about doing that, you can put uh, your uh, driver's license debt right. number. But if it happened that your voter registration card uh, was your was your social security uh, number and you decided to put down your uh, your license number on the application for the absentee ballot, those aren't going to match, obviously, and they can throw the ballot out. They can throw the application out. And there's no requirement that the clerk contact the voter and say, we've got a problem here. Your numbers don't match. Would you like to try to correct that situation? And I pointed out that I think that's a real problem because a lot of people now, as we've all been taught, will not reveal their social security numbers. Even the last four di digits they become hesitant about. And so they very well may pull out their, their license uh, card and, and write that down. And then when it goes back to the clerk's office, it won't match. So to me, it's just a, another way that people are going to get disqualified from voting. I think there were some other issues in the, the bill that I don't remember. I remember that as being a real problem. And I questioned the author on the floor about that. And she didn't seem to, uh, you know, to dispute that that could possibly happen. But, you know, maybe it'll get fixed in the second half of session. Maybe it won't. So... I know there were some other things in there, but that to me was the thing that really stuck out in my mind as being a problem with it. For those of you who are on here instead of on Facebook, <laughs> um, in the chat, um, and I believe this was from Stacy, she actually quoted from the bill. So we've got, uh, that prohibits the Indiana Election Commission from instituting, increasing or expanding vote by mail or absentee vote by mail. So no matter whether the pandemic 
or another pandemic comes into play. The election right. commission has no power to do anything. Uh, changing the time, place, or manner of holding an election, okay. uh, moving the primary. I mean, there's right. simply tying all the knots that they can tie that, that will limit voting. Um, and then the ID is mentioned. And then, um, yeah, but it, it's contradictory. And I think that's part of what you were getting at, Tim. It, it prohibits a person from providing an absentee ballot application with the driver's license number or last four digits of the voter's social security number already printed on the form. Right. But then it also requires them to include one of the two. Right. And, and they have to. Not, yep. 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 So that's a problem, I think. So, yeah. And then um, obviously, then it's the governor's ability to do anything either in an emergency. I think, again, we need to contact our legislators and say, this works against every voter having the ability to vote. It works against dealing with common sense issues when, you know, an emergency arises. Right. And I know in our election committee, uh, the, my Democratic colleagues and I have had amendments that would expand absentee voting. Uh, one of them that we really wanted to do was to get rid of the um, excuses you have to have. Uh, but every one of our amendments got shot down that dealt with, with those kinds of issues. Uh, we did get one, though, I have to say, that would uh, extend the time to uh, get your absentee ballot in. Right now it's noon on election day. This would extend it to 6 p.m. So that was... But not in every county, right? Well, yeah, there is the question of, of those that have... Um, uh, vote centers? Uh, vote, no, it has to do with um, uh, oh, the ballots that you use. Uh, yeah. how they're counted. Yeah. And so those that have to, have to be counted, um, so if it's el the electronic counting, they're fine. But um, I think that you, there are ways to be able to do it with those that are the, the other type. There aren't as many of those. They're usually in smaller counties. And so <clears throat> hopefully we can get that fixed as well. Because it would be very confusing if in one county uh, something ends at 6 p.m. and the other one at noon. Right. Right. So there's another question in the chat. Um, Sue, do you think Re uh, Representative Goodwine is finally convening the Environmental Affairs Committee just to make sure that Senate Bill 389 gets a hearing? Is that the wetlands bill? 389, I'm trying to remember. I I think so, that, but that was Jenny Je uh, Jenkins. Jenny, yes, um, she says yes. Okay. Um, no, I, that's not the reason. Uh, the IDEM agency bill started in the Senate and it's a bill that's going to be heard on Wednesday. There are two of them. One of them has to do is the agency bill and it's, you know, changes some things. It's not really controversial at all. Um, however, one of the bills that was not heard in the first half dealing with coal ash uh, pits, um, that is going to be inserted as an amendment into that bill. So um, actually, I, there may be two amendments addressing that. One of them is um, being authored by my colleague who had the original coal ash bill that died. And she's working with IDEM to try to get some of those, uh, uh, those things in it, into this uh, amendment. Uh, the other one is really, um, it's a, an amendment that is trying, from what I understand, I haven't actually seen it yet, 
is trying to put guardrails around what the EPA would do by giving IDEM some permitting powers over how to deal with these leaking coal ash pits. Mm. Uh, and the reason being is, you know, we have a new administration <laughs> right. and new head of EPA, and there's some concern that they would be uh, more, you know, restrictive and prescriptive than what mm. some people would like. So that is a bill to watch to see what happens with, with those two amendments. The one that you're asking about, the wetlands bill, has not been uh, up for a hearing in the House yet. And there's a, the chairman of the committee uh, thinks that that bill needs to be modified if he's gonna give it a hearing. So there are discussions going on behind the scenes to see if there's something less drastic that could be done or whether the bill will just die for, for lack of a hearing in the house. So that's, Ugh. we, that the Environmental Affairs Committee meets on Mondays at 1030. And as I say, I think there's three or four more opportunities to meet yeah. after, after this Monday. So that's one to keep your eye on. So yeah. go ahead, Tim. Well, I was just going to say, Sue, that bill, that wetlands bill, I, I don't serve on the uh, Environmental Affairs Committee in the Senate, but we did have extensive debate on that, uh, about that on the floor and also in our caucus. And that is a very harmful bill. It would leave many wetlands in the state of Indiana unprotected whatsoever. And uh, because it basically will say that the only wetland protection there is is on a federal level and unfortunately in the last administration protection for wetlands was greatly decreased so uh, it, it, that bill is so harmful that i don't know if you saw this or not but the former uh, republican chair of uh, the senate environmental committee bev garg wrote a uh op, a, a, a editorial opinion that was published in many papers around the state saying that that was a bad bill and that that bill um, you know, will be very, very harmful to the environment in the state of Indiana. So it'd be best if that bill simply died in the, in the house. Yeah. But I don't know, I worry when they say they're gonna try to fix a bad bill like that, it still ends up being, uh, you know, rather than being 100% bad, it ends up being about 95% bad is what has been my experience. So. I hope people will realize that uh, protecting our, our wetlands is so important because of the, the good that it does for our environment. I don't know much about it, but I do know this. It, it, wetlands serve as a, a giant sponge to soak up uh, excess uh, water that's out there in the environment and to prevent uh, ponding, uh, harmful ponding and, and flooding even. And it protects so much wildlife too. So I hope that, uh, I, quite frankly, I hope that bill would simply, would simply die. But uh, uh, it, it warrants careful attention as, it, as the second half proceeds. Yeah, uh, my, that's my desire as well. And I, I've seen a list of around 70 organizations right. of all types that are opposing the bill. So I'm hoping that you know, I think that uh, Representative Chairman Gutwein is listening. Good. And um, he's listed, I believe, as a co-sponsor on the bill, but I think that may be so he can keep a good eye on it. Good. He's not the primary sponsor. Very good. Okay. Um, let me see. There's another question. Um, here, is Delaware County moving early voting out to the new Justice Center now that the clerk's office moved out of downtown? Uh, I, asked, um, I asked our clerk if that was what was going to happen. And at the time, he said no. So I think they are planning to keep it downtown. He said they would keep that election office 
there on the first floor. Um, however, one of my um, one of my amendments in the election committee was to allow drop boxes, and it was defeated. Right. But uh, I still think you know we have that drop box for property tax payments out there in the circle drive. Why not put an election drop box out there at the time of elections? I'm, I mean, we, I'm sure we have, my amendment would have required uh, 24 hour security, like a security camera. Um, so I think it would be a safe and convenient option for people. I agree. <laughs> Keep working on it, Sue. I will. <laughs> um, there's another question uh, for you, Tim. Yes. If you're, if you're familiar with House Bill 1337, the one that would prohibit local governments from using their zoning and planning authority to ban or regulate factory farms and logging operations from being built or taking place too near municipal boundaries, um, it's been assigned to the local government committee. Uh, do you know anything about that or where it's going? How you, what you- uh, Well, I serve on the local government uh, committee, so I'm familiar with what we have considered up this point in time. We've not considered that bill, um, but uh, the chair, I, I don't think has posted an agenda for the coming week. I'll have to double check on that, but as of last Thursday, which was the last time that the, uh, I'm sorry, this past Thursday, which was the last time local government met, it had not been considered. Um, it, I would be very concerned about that. That's another uh, erosion of our home rule in the state of Indiana, but this is the year, it seems like, to attack those type of things. So uh, I, I, I will be concerned. I'll keep an eye on that. And uh, I, I, we'll just have to see if it gets posted or not. It has not up to this point in time, as far as I know. Okay. And I think that one uh, had to deal with the Right to Farm Act, yeah. which would have uh, made it even more difficult for neighbors of CAFOs. I, although, but it goes beyond just CAFOs. It also uh, would involve uh, other types of industry. So definitely it's something to try to stop in the Senate. I had a bill that died in committee that did just the opposite. It tried to level the playing field uh, that uh, had become unbalanced by uh, a court case uh, in the last year, I think it was, that really interpreted Indiana's right to farm law in a very lopsided manner that uh, doesn't uh, allow for uh, the neighbors who were there first <laughs> to um, do uh, have uh, suits lawsuits uh, dealing with um, you know their their health public health uh, or with their property rights uh, many uh, the, many of them have found their property values have you know maybe gone down in half of what they had been right. so um that's i think the issue uh that these two bills are on the opposite side yeah and that right to farm bill has has proven um difficult to deal with so um changing the subject Another question, House Bill 1577, uh, it appears that it will make doctors violate their Hippocratic Oath by having to lie wait a minute, uh, to patients and tell them that a pill-induced abortion could be reversed. There seems to be no way that this will stand up in the courts, but... Yes, it passed in the House. Mm -hmm. uh, I spoke against it, and that was one of the points that I made. Uh, as well as uh, Robin Shackelford, Representative Shackelford, who serves on the Public Health Committee, uh, spoke against it uh, both in committee and on the floor. Uh, it deals with um, uh, some 
people say that um, an abortion, if you're getting an abortion by uh, with pills rather than surgery, that and it takes two pills. And the thought is, well, if you change your mind after the first pill, you can reverse what's happening. Well, the <laughs> The medical experts say, no, that's not possible. And that's why um, the person who asked the question uh, phrased it in requiring doctors to, um, to say something that's not true. Uh, but that didn't seem to make any difference and the bill passed. So now it's over in the Senate, Tim. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I just cringe every time I see a bill like that. Um, and I was trying to see what committee had been sent to in the uh, in the Senate, but I'm not able to uh, to immediately do that. So uh, if it go in the concern that one would have would be it, it should go to health, I would think, and um, the health committee in the Senate is chaired by Ed Charbonneau, who was a fairly reasonable individual, um, somewhat moderate uh, member of the supermajority, but seems to yield to a lot of pressure to hear these bills. And certainly, I don't think it would go to judiciary, which is, would be uh, a, a real problem because the chair of that is uh, Liz Brown, and she is a uh, very, very uh, radical when it comes to being anti-choice. And she would definitely <laughs> want to see that bill be given a hearing. So I don't know. The other thing I found uh, in more recent uh, sessions, for whatever reason, they tend to hold some of these more controversial bills towards the end of, uh, in this case, our consideration of House bills. And I think they believe it just, you know, gets mixed in then with everything else that's going on and the hubbub of the end of the uh, session before we go in the conference committees. And uh, so I, you have to keep an eye on something like that right up to the very end. And you know, we really have a better way to um, see that we have fewer abortions and that has to do with prevention of pregnancy. Right. Uh, if we made uh, access to uh, contraceptives easier, more affordable, and if we had comprehensive, medically accurate sex education in our schools, I think we really could cut down on the number yeah. of, of abortions by, because a woman who doesn't get pregnant doesn't even have to think about it. And ironically, the uh, proponents or the anti-abortion uh, folks are uh, vehemently against both of those ideas. Yes, yes. That's the irony of it. And no, not, I, I'm not supporting the children who are born who are not wanted. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, we have a question about who people can contact given that the Democrats are in a super minority and the concern about anyone who's not a constituent addressing a member of the Senate or the House. But I know we recommend for the league that we can contact anyone who is on a committee hearing a bill and give that uh, information or that perspective to all the committee members because it's the committee that determines whether it's going to get out to either the House or the Senate right. for action. Yes. So Tim and Sue, what do you think about that kind of advice? I think it's good advice, but I think the first thing that anybody should do uh, is, is check and make sure they know who their legislators are. Well, yes. And I, and I would say this, if it's neither Sue nor I, contact them. Uh, because I, I, there's probably a good chance that, uh, unfortunately, they are, they are a member of the supermajority and they need to hear from a constituent that, their feelings and that they oppose these bills, uh, et cetera. So that's my first advice. And with a little bit of luck, maybe they serve on one of these important committees. But uh, legislators, I don't wanna say we don't pay attention to 
people other than our constituents, but we certainly pay more attention to people who are constituents. So I think the first thing to do is check and see. If, if, it's, if your legislator, like I said, either whether it's a senator or representative, somebody other than Sue and I, get on the horn and contact. Mm -hmm. yes. And further, I would say, do you have friends in other parts of the state, in other you know, counties that feel the way you do? Ask them to contact their legislators because they do live in their in their um, districts. And the state website has a very handy tool. If you don't know right. uh, who your legislator is, you can put in your address and zip code and that will tell you who it is. Okay, then we've got a couple of more questions. Um, one is from Pam Taylor read that mental health and addiction services could lose 26 million over the next two years. Uh, it's a quote from the Brandon George, Vice President of Mental Health America. It was a 131% increase in calls to Indiana's Be Well Crisis uh, helpline. And Holcomb is in support of reinstating this money but says it lies with the senators. Do you have any updates on this? I'm sure that's part of the budget. And, and Sue, I don't know, do you remember that specific aspect of the budget? which is a huge document and covers yeah. so much. I, I would understand if you don't know that detail. Yeah, yeah I, I think that was another reason why so many of us on the Democrat side voted, well, every one of us on the Democratic side voted against that budget. I will say this, this is where this gets a little complicated in terms of the CARES Act dollars and the, and the you know, future pandemic dollars that we may receive. As a caucus, we have talked about our concern that it could be that for funding for something like that, the uh, architects of the, the budget, and by that I mean the majority members of the budget committee, of the appropriations committee, may say, well, we think we're going to get federal dollars for that. So that's why we're not funding it at the full uh, level as we have in the past. But we're we're hesitant to say we know that for sure. So we would like to see those funding levels stay up. Now, you know, it's, it's the, the fact is that Indiana, we've weathered the pandemic pretty well in terms of the budget. The dollars uh, were not impacted as severely as we thought they would. So I'm concerned that a lot of this, well, we don't have the money because of the pandemic. I think we need to, uh, carefully analyze whether that's the case or not in any given situation. I also know, or I feel like there's some, plenty of areas like mental health uh, that we know, whether it's funding for education, whether it's funding for home health care, whether it's funding for our, our nursing homes, that we know Indiana lags. And we're going. I think we need to really take a look at trying to bolster some of those areas. I think we found out the uh, to our detriment, tragically, uh, that when it comes to public health in the state of Indiana, we are not where we should be. And I don't think we were prepared in terms of addressing the pandemic. I know it was something that no one could predict, but um, I hope we learned some lessons by, by in that regards too, going forward. Uh, we've known for years that our public health infrastructure is is full of holes. Right. Uh, on mental health, uh, every year legislators send out a legislative survey, uh, usually in December is usually when we send them out. And this year I asked the question, how has the pandemic affected you personally? And there were several options, you know, economically, health, et cetera. I was surprised that the one that was most often checked was mental health. People really have suffered through the, all the, rest, you know, the isolation that we've had to impose on ourselves in this pandemic. And I think if we ever needed to increase um, mental health funding, this is the time. Right. Yeah. We had um, 
a quick question on House Bill 260, the one about high school students working with the in the elections. Um, if you could give any more information about what the suggestions are. I know that they were allowed to work uh, in this past election as election workers. Um, anything else you want to add in what's in the bill? Uh, yeah, they would be able to serve in any position except, um, I think it's inspector, the top, the top position. He's in charge. Yeah, the one that's in charge. Any of the others, they could uh, actually be that per, that position, or they could assist with that position. They can assist during the before the election, getting preparing things during the election, and when they're counting, they could also have a role. Are they going to be? This is Julie Mason. Are they going to be paid? Yes. Are they going to be volunteered? And and, and then is there age? Is there age? limitation um i can't remember if there was a lower you know limit like 16. Mm -hmm. uh, and i would say if they are in an official position like sheriff mm -hmm. poll book holder they would be paid i think yeah. that's right they get paid whatever the other uh people working at the polls get paid i don't think it's a whole lot but it's but it's something for the day and gotcha. I was me. trying to find what was that Senate bill number again, please? HB two sixty. I don't know what this two sixty. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Let me see. I was thinking it lowered the the age. Uh, two sixty. Let me see if I can quickly look at that. If you want to go on to something else, I can. Okay. Uh, supplement that. Okay. Thank something. you. So the other the um the issue that hangs over all of us is redistricting and. Mm -hmm. I know that um, there, there is in our, in law or in procedures, a five member group that is supposed to deal with the maps if the legislature can't do it. Now, what I'm hearing is that the legislature is going to have a special session. So this five member, which would be all Republicans this year, um, committee would not be doing it in a smoke filled room. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the usual picture. But do, what can you tell us about any more specifics? Uh, we don't have dates set yet or anything else, but what can you tell us about what has been said for redistricting? What I'm hearing is that yes, we will have a special session because the Census Bureau isn't expected to, and they've told us, the states that they won't have our data to us until and maybe the end of September. And so what will happen, what I'm hearing will happen is that all of the, the work will be done and then the legislature will be called back into session for one day. Uh, similar to the session we had a couple of years ago when the Muncie school issue was one of the issues and it would deal just, this one would deal just with, with redistricting. One day. Is that what you're, hear Is that what you're hearing, Tim, that we would um, be called back for one day? I haven't heard it to be limited to one day, but I have heard it that it would be a quick session, even if it was like a three day or something. I, I guess there's the issue of how would you, could you suspend rules and not allow it to have to go through the committee process or anything like that? So I, I don't know uh, about that, but but that is what we're hearing, although they're being pretty tight-lipped about it. Or it, maybe they don't know because, you know, they, they, we're not going to have the data till sometime in September. There is this issue of, I believe there's a current statute as to the uh, the uh, congressional districts. It says that if we don't get them done by the end of our regular session, then it goes to a commission yeah. to draw the lines. That's right. And I have heard that they they do not want that to happen, so they may pass a, an amendment which would at least deal with that and push back the date by which that has to be done so it does not go to the commission. 
But other than that, the whole issue of redistricting and how it's going to occur, what input the, the public will have. You know, in the past, they've at least allowed the public to see the, the maps. They've posted them online. They, they've days. <laughs> two hearings around the state on them. So I don't know if they're going to, to have that or not. We're, we're looking at that as a caucus and trying to see what we can do in the second half to try to get some clarification that would at least allow uh, the public to weigh in on these things. But uh, I don't know. Given the delay that's occurred, who knows what they're going to do. So Tim and Sue, um, in your caucus, if you could just make everyone aware that there is uh, the Indiana Citizen Redistricting Commission currently holding, shoot, <laughs> I can't stop. Uh, currently holding public hearings in each congressional district and the one for this district is next, is the 16th. So it's coming up, um, I can, post the, well, you can register at allinfordemocracy.org or you can go to lwvin.org and you'll see the articles okay. and you can and register. Because the effort, I mean, we've not gotten anywhere, the, the league and this coalition that we've been in with uh, Common Cause and 24 other nonpartisan groups for the last decade, but the coalition has grown in the last five years as we've worked on trying to get some legislation through. That hasn't been successful. Right. So uh, this is an effort to demonstrate that a citizens commission can gather the criteria that should be used for drawing fair maps and that using that criteria, we can draw maps that are fair to voters. So what these hearings are doing is asking the public who are coming to the hearings what criteria they would use to draw the maps. Um, you know, compactness, com uh, incumbent blind, um, keeping communities of interest together. There are a, you know, a lot of issues that are coming up and those criteria can be fed into District R, which is the map making um, service software that the league uses, that our coalition is using, uh, and people are being asked or will be asked to draw maps that will be submitted in a competition. The winning maps and the report from the Citizen Commission will come to the legislature as, as well as much publicity as we can get out there so that there is more transparency in this process. I mean, so if you guys can keep us aware of all the timing and the things okay. that the legislature we does. Will. We'd we love will. it. Yes. But, but also get people, uh, I mean, tell the caucus, get, get your colleagues to come to the hearings. Um, and that, what was that, what was that uh, site again, lwvin.org? Yes, that's, the, that's League of Women Voters of Indiana, lwvin.org. Okay. And the alternative is all, all in for democracy, one word, dot org. Okay. okay, thank you. That's our coalition. And there are different days for each congressional district yes. hearing? Yes. Have any of them been heard so far? Yes. yes. And you can actually see the recordings, all in for democracy, dot org. I'm not sure how many of them are up yet, but uh, you can see the recordings of the earlier ones if you want to get on there too but sign up for ours on the 16th. Okay. I'm Great. signed up. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so um, let's see. Um, we've got another question about hmm, the racist actions in the house this session. Oh. Has Todd Houston done anything to censure those who acted out? Not that I'm aware of. Um, he has said that he's going to um, be more proactive if, I mean, the, the what went on with the booing and hissing during session is, uh, it violates our rules of decorum. 
And I have a feeling if he were, I mean, this is his first year. Right. Um, probably Brian Bosma would have gaveled him out of order immediately. But I think that because he's new, he didn't. And so it got to the point that it did. And after the, afterwards, uh, when we met again, he apologized for what happened and said that he was going to be much more, um, you know, quick, more, he would act more quickly. But the, uh, the Black Legislative Caucus actually starting last summer had asked that we have uh, an all uh, legislator uh, implicit bias training. And uh, they repeated that, that desire after this incident happened and added uh, the request that those members be disciplined, but none of that has happened so far. There's been at the State House uh, uh, several organizations, uh, people of color from Indianapolis, I think primarily, have um, had a silent vigil on, in the State House. They've limited themselves to 20 people at a time because of COVID, right. but uh, they've been there for two weeks now. I don't know if they're planning to continue. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Black Caucus just had a press conference Thursday to reiterate uh, that something needs to happen. So I think we're not, they're not going to give up and we're, we're supporting them and yeah, uh, but something will happen. I, you know, okay, that happened in the house and I, I didn't, you know, I wasn't a witness to it and, but obviously it's something which should not have happened and I think the idea of some bias training is a good idea and I, we have for the last several sessions had uh, two hours of ethics training and, and one of those include uh, uh, sexual harassment training and so I don't know why we couldn't include that uh, going forward as part of what of the annual training that we do and so I'm hoping that maybe the leaders um, if not this session, we'll at least consider going uh, forward that uh, that be something which is, uh, which is done. You know, there, we all can learn. And uh, as much as I'm sure the legislators want to feel like they are not racist or that they don't have implicit bias, um, you know, how do we know? And so I think it would be a, a good idea. You, the more you learn, the, the, more, the more that you are uh, aware. And so I, I just, uh, I hope that maybe lead, the leadership will seriously consider what happened, take uh, action to prevent it from happening again. It, it was, it was not good. And they, I, I've had people ask me what happened. Now they, they think we're all together down there and, and you know, that, that this happened and I saw it and I said, no, I just know what I heard and it was not right. So uh, I hope it's a lesson we can learn going forward. The State League put a letter to the editor and to the Indianapolis Star expressing our dismay at the behavior. Good. good. A lot of good that does, but at least. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know somebody asked whether we had heard anything from Elizabeth Rare, who was supposed to have participated today. Judy? <laughs> I spoke with her legislative assistant on Thursday and uh, he assured me she was coming and asked me to send him the link, which I did. And that's the last I heard. Okay. And that wasn't the first, I mean, we've been in correspondence before right. that. Right. I was just reaffirm reaffirming it on Thursday. Okay. Well, I know she is supposed to uh, be in a, a meeting with people in Anderson coming up in the next couple of days. But. I did invite all the other um, legislators for the area too, including Mike Gaskell. Um, I got, I think, two uh, 
no's, but the rest didn't even respond. Who were the no's from? I'm sorry, Sue. Oh, I uh, Ann, Ann Vermillion told me no. And um, Anthony or Tony Cook was a maybe. Um, again, Elizabeth Raul Ray was a yes. And uh, Mike Gaskell did not respond. Uh, did J.D. Prescott respond? Um, I don't think I had his name. So, oh, we, oh, no, 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 he was a no. Mm -hmm. And I had his legislative assistant, uh, Dolan Monroe, and I spoke with him pri or personally, mm -hmm. and he said no. Okay. We have so many uh, legislators in this county. It's hard to keep track of all of them. That's, Some of them part, have that's part of the redistricting <laughs> issue. Yes. <laughs> Tony Cook has one precinct in Delaware County. Yeah. And Gaskell doesn't have much either. Just the Northern. But he has me, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's see, we got another question. Um, HB 1369 will go to the Judiciary Committee and Senator Liz Brown is the chair. What can be done when the majority of Hoosiers support permits for carrying handguns and Superintendent Doug Carter is vehemently opposed to this bill as is the Police Chiefs Association? We're hoping Liz Brown will not give this a hearing. Um, SB 199, expanding the stand your ground law is also troubling. We signed a petition asking uh, against HB 1369, so we can submit to Liz Brown, and there's a link. But do you want to talk about SB 1369? Well, let me just say this. Uh, it, it is a good sign that it's not been uh, scheduled for a hearing yet. I don't think it has. Um, I know she's put out a agenda for this coming Wednesday, and I'll check it. But I don't think it is yet. It hasn't been scheduled yet. So, um, yes, I think, again, if people can just let the chair know and, and that they have legislators who serve on that committee, I serve on judiciary. I obviously think it's a terrible idea, and most people think it's a bad idea. And, and I think most of the uh, uh, editorials I've seen are opposed to it, and uh, it is still an effective way to keep guns. Uh, or at least the, the right to, to carry a, a gun and out of the hands of people who should be disqualified. I think I read something here recently that of all the permit applications that uh, were put in the last year, 4% of them were rejected. And that would have been 4% more people carrying guns possibly mm -hmm. shouldn't. So um, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an unpopular bill, but it's popular with certain you know, interest groups. So Sue, I don't know if you got anything to add on that or not. Well, I guess I'd just say that it has several aspects to it that stem from the permitless carry. And one of them is when police, and this is one of the reasons that uh, State uh, Superintendent Carter opposes it is if some you stop someone for, or you know, a police officer uh, approaches somebody, they don't know if they're someone who sh should be on a list to not have a gun because right. this will do away with the, the database that they have right now. Now the bill says they will have some new database, but there's a lot of um, concern that it's not really going to be able to identify people if they don't have to have a permit or not a permit. I so know. that's uh, one of the things. Uh, the other thing is the money end of it. Oh, uh, yeah. You pay to have a permit just like you pay to have a driver's license. And so there's 
quite a, a lot of money in those permits that's going to go away. And that money has been used for police training and other police matters, mostly for police training. Mm -hmm. So some people have said, you know, it's this kind of thing that's defunding the police. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, the house did put some money into uh, police training more than what we ordinarily would, but I don't believe it was enough to make up for what is lost in this bill. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't see other questions that we've not handled. Is there anyone else with a question for Sue or Tim? We really appreciate your time and uh, your knowledge in speaking with us, uh, letting us know what we're looking for uh, in the, as the legislature continues to meet. And um, thank you for your service, keeping us all in better shape. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really uh, am glad you have this opportunity to share what's happening in the legislature. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank everybody. you. Okay. Bye all. Bye. Bye bye.